Five seconds. Shed driving. Looking up. One second to go for the win. He got it. The Cougars win it. Number one remains number one. Cougars reset. Jackson again. Finds it. And the Houston Cougars go from the first floor out to the Sweet 16. Stick it in your pipe and smoke it, baby. Yes! Welcome to the Scott Holman Podcast, emergency podcast. Dana Holgerson no longer being head football coach of the University of Houston edition. Uh, something that I think uh, we thought we talked a lot. We talked almost a gratuitous amount uh, last episode. And I, I say it's my fault for doing so about things we we're thankful for. And guys, I get to give a lot of things in my personal life that I am more thankful for than something related to the University of Houston uh, and its now former football coach. But in terms of things in the University of Houston sphere in my life, I don't think there's anything I'm more grateful for in the recent history than Daniel Holgerson being relieved of his duties as of this morning. We are recording this on the afternoon of Sunday, November 26th. Uh, now, former head coach Daniel Holgerson officially let go, as usual, by media report, and then University of Houston officially confirming with Chris Pesman being the one on the statement. So that's the basic facts as we know them. Dustin, my friend and co-host, how are you feeling now that we are in a post Dana Holgerson Cougar football world? Man, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to be talking about U of H looking for a new head football coach. I'm excited because as we are recording this, we are all second screening watching the uh, yeah, we are. volleyball NCAA selection show and waiting to Let's find go, out. Let's go, ladies. Expect at some point during this episode that we will suddenly... Uh, get excited and get devolve and talk about uh, go off topic and talk about volleyball for five minutes and then probably get back on topic to, uh, to Dana getting fired and the, the search for the new coach. Um, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Like I said, it's, it's kind of this beautiful moment where it's, it's exciting and scary at the same time. Cause right. Cause your next side could be anybody, right. I've, I literally have heard 10 names already in the, like a few hours. And I'm like, yeah, I feel like there's a non-zero chance we could hire that guy. Right. So it's just, there's so many options out there. So many guys to consider. But I mean, more than anything, I think, we were all ready for anything new and uh, you know, but for a better or for worse, this means we're getting anything new next season. So that alone, I think is worth being excited about. Bobby, how you feeling, bud? Good, man. I'm good. It's been a crazy weekend. Just when you work in retail, you know, this has been kind of a crazy weekend. So uh, we can have Thanksgiving is a big retail weekend. Little, you learn new things little, every day. Uh, yeah. A little, a little tired, but uh, you know, sometimes you get news and it just puts a little wind in your sails and uh, you can get going a little bit more, you know, Dustin, you, you said it perfectly there, like for better or worse or good or bad, like it, anything could happen. And it just reminded me of the, um, the uh, classic family guy moment when he's like, it could be anything. It could be a boat. <laughs> like, the mystery box. Just, yeah, the mystery box. It's, it's a mystery box. It's a new coach. It could be anything. It could be Dana Holgerson. Like, I know. swear I thought of that exact same example. And I was like, there's no way it's a terrible example because, you know, the best thing in the mystery box was that you could hope that it was going to be the same thing you already had. So, I mean, to be clear, we are, that is not the situation we're in. I, I like the analogy. I thought of the same it thing. It could be so. Major Applewhite. Like, you it's no, oh, shit. <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> that, that that would be some it'd be it'd be very funny for about five seconds that we went full circle there and then also extremely unfunny when i think about what major actually did his two years as head coach here so yeah kind of said the facts as they are dana holgerson following uh saturday's 27 13 loss uh, to ucf to end the season four and eight was uh was dismissed as of this morning i think it was a ra- was it around like 10 30 I, I think central time i'm doing i'm kind of doing the math there um I think just a move that had to happen, a move that this this was never going to be a fan base that would get back on side with Dana Holgerson. I I think that's the reason why it had to be done. I mean, are there theoretically possible things that Dana Holgerson could have done to make his seat less warm, to have retained his job into the coming year? Absolutely, man. A a certain spot goes a certain way in an October game against the Longhorns. As bad as this last month has looked, if this is a five and seven finish where one of those wins is over that school wouldn't have been surprised if he had been kept on here as head coach. And I'm not going to say I would have loved that decision, but it, it would have, it would have been somewhat defensible, but this was, this was a program that showed no progress from week one to week. The last, if anything, it was negative progress because you beat a UTSA team in week one that turned out to be pretty solid. Obviously they didn't look like themselves the first month of the season, but you don't have to retcon that. That was a pretty good win. Didn't see much else that you could describe as pretty good 
the rest of the season. Your first loss to Rice in 13 years. And in Big 12 play, having six of the nine uh, games being decided by double digits. Uh, obviously, your two wins were decided by single digits. The Hail Mary win over West Virginia and the overtime win uh, at Baylor. And I think, to hand it off to you guys, I think that's why we're talking about a different head coach right now. I think the expectations were modest this first season, believe me. All the uh, propaganda uh, out of Colin Boulevard going into the season was keep your expectations modest. Uh, don't expect a team that's going to seriously contend for Big 12 hard this year. I don't think any of us did, but I, I don't think it's easy to talk yourself into into there really being any kind of progress made here. And I think that's why we're talking about a different football coach, not to mention, I, I think, a coach who just consistently failed failed to say the right things anytime he was in front of a microphone. Like, you can like someone's candor. To some degree, I do like the candor we got from Dana Holgers in the last five years. But when the candor is, I've stopped recruiting the current high school senior class, you don't really appreciate that candor. So I guess I'll I'll open it to you guys. Why do you what do you think is the biggest reason why we're here now talking about a coaching change in the uh, Houston Cougar football program? I, I mean, I think the biggest thing is the results in the field. But literally, the first bullet point I have in my notes is just it, it wasn't one thing; it was everything. And you kind of touched on it there. It was the results in the field. It was the fact that we're five years in, and and there's not really. Uh, I mean, I guess I guess maybe UTSA away. But like, there's not really just kind of like a a hallmark win you can really hang your hat on. There's not a a win over a good power conference team that you can go, okay, yeah. And you know, it's Houston has been up and down over the years. Houston will probably continue to be up and down in the future, but just to never really get a, get that win that you go, okay, yeah. You know, if we beat the like like you said, Sam, if we beat the Longhorns this year, you've got one, right? You can say, okay, you know, we've got a win to hang our hats on. But it was you know on the field, you just weren't beating good teams. And you were, you know, seeing an increasing trend. Well, the, the best thing you could say about Dana through his first three plus seasons was that he he beat every bad team in front of him. Essentially, we just never really saw this team lose to bad teams. It was kind of that maddening and consistent. You know, okay, well, we can't beat a good team, but at least we don't lose to bad teams. But now we're losing to bad teams too. You're just, you're having all of the you know downside of being a boom and bust team without any of the boom, without any of the exciting. Uh, the excitement of it. So I, mean, I think the results in the field is, is it's a, you know, it's a, res- it's a results business. So certainly that's number one, but I think it's the fact that the recruiting disaster that we're seeing is, is happening right now. The where like you said, the giving up on the class, the, uh, the, 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 the currently being in the, you know, one hundreds of the recruiting rankings, the you know, only eight commitments, the being ranked behind every other, every, every single P five team and a bunch of group of five teams. Like, and it's, and like you said, it's, it's the being completely antagonistic towards the fan base. It's the refusal to take any responsibility for anything, though, whatever you want to call it. But just the absolute, you know, refusal to like take anything seemingly seriously to just like the lack of urgency, right? You know, the, that we saw in game multiple times. We saw it most recently against UCF, but you know, down three scores and just kind of like strolling, strolling downfield. And just like, yeah, yeah, we'll get there eventually. And just, yeah, if if it takes seven minutes to march down the field, that's fine. You know, never mind. There's one quarter left and we're down three scores, whatever. And just the kind of the casualness with which he talks about the recruiting, the, uh, like I said, the, just the everything being someone else's fault. Oh, we're gonna have to talk to my assistants about that. Oh, well, the players have to do better. You know, Dr. Couture talks time and time and time again about wanting to see the fire in people's bellies, right? Dana Holgerson has no fire in his belly whatsoever, right? He, he didn't have it towards anything other than maybe getting the team up for one or two games this year. He doesn't have it for recruiting. He doesn't have it for challenging himself with new ideas and new coaches. He doesn't have it with feeling like, you know, he needs to take making the fan base excited to see Cougar football seriously. He just He's just like, I'm here and everyone should be happy that I'm here and should just be happy with anything that I do and should just, you know, not criticize anything I do. And it's just... It's like I said, it's it's not one thing, it's everything, but uh at the end of the day you sure come back to the uh the wins and losses, which have been uh not impressive enough and too numerous uh respectively. Yeah, for me, I you know if you don't have the hundred and first ranked recruiting class going into this year, if you're a top forty recruiting class, you can point to that, right? You go, you know what, this team's returning some guys, they got, you know, uh I mean, who knows? But if Holgerson stays, you assume that Donovan Smith stays. You you got a good young receiving core. You got a good young uh um running back in Parker Jenkins. You got a lot of stuff there. But and and maybe you can justify keeping him here another year for that. 
And then, you know, you got this class coming in and maybe you can justify it in those ways. You know, if your recruiting's better, if you're recruiting at a top 40 level, it's hard to get rid of you, right? If you, if you are the number 40 class, number 37, number 38, and look, I understand it's hard to recruit, right? Top 40 is asking a lot, even if you're top 50, right? I'd like to see us in top 40 with our location and some of that stuff. But, you know, if you're top 40, we're probably not moving on from Dana Holgerson. I mean, you go, the on-field performance isn't there, but look at this recruiting class. we got a hell of a recruiting class coming in. Why don't we keep them, see how this recruiting class looks, get these guys in here on a uh, on a visit, or on uh, get these guys in here on campus, have them fall in love with the city. Uh, Jack Freeman talked about that, right? When he's a Dallas kid, but when he moved, uh, when he moved to Houston, Houston's home to him now, right? Get some guys on campus on that class. But what's, what's the worst that could happen by letting him go now? Your recruiting class falls apart. There's eight guys, right? Like, okay, we lose them. We didn't have much of a class anyways. Uh, you know, are we going to perform worse on the field? Can't really, right? I, but I think if you if you're exactly where we are now, but you have a better recruiting class, I think he maybe stays. Dustin, you're absolutely right. It's culmination of everything. But for me, the final straw is kind of the the recruiting class and in kicking uh, kicking the can on this uh, on this recruiting class. Like it's just inexplicable how you would just go. Yeah, no, we're done. It's arrogance. Just, it's it's yeah. it's from a guy who didn't think he was. Gonna be fired. It's a guy who was willing to say on the record they had a fucking impossible buyout. Yep. Which is a bullshit thing to say. It's a bullshit thing to act like you're unfireable. Like mm-hmm. I get having job and I think job security to some degree is good. I think this program got too too used to the pushing the firing button as the solution to the problem. And usually usually patience I think is the right answer. But it's like you said at the top, Bobby. All the indicators were bad. The past indicators, this this team hadn't consistently performed. You were coming off a season that it was a very disappointing 2022 season. You had a future mm-hmm. NFL quarterback and one of the better uh, rookie receivers. Uh, and I think that might even be underselling what Tank Dell is this year for the Texans. You had those two guys in your program, veteran guys who should have known the system in an, you know, in, inside and out and guys who performed, I think up, up to expectation, but the product was so bad around Clayton tune and Tank Dell in all, you know, a lot of ways. I, I think, most notably your defense and this this coach's hand-picked defensive coordinator Doug Belk who failed pretty badly the last years but your past indicators are bad your present indicator the current season and I would say is bad I would say another one of those is something we've talked about a, a lot already the 2024 recruiting class only had eight guys and you know Dana's talking at the UCF post game about potentially 60 different guys in the program it's like where are you finding the like how are you going to find quality depth when you're talking about like a large portion of the roster getting turned over on a, on an off season or after an off season where you turned over almost half this current roster, so the present indicators are bad, and the future indicators, the recruiting, is bad. The desire of this coach to hold himself accountable. I, I think I mentioned in a previous pod, Samson after the closest win over Utah in the Charleston event, talking about how you know I didn't get my guys ready and account. You know, he basically said it was his fault that the team didn't do better against some of Utah's sharpshooting bigger guys. When have you ever heard Dana Holgerson take that kind of accountability in five years, a man who hasn't accomplished a fraction of what Kelvin Sampson did. So it it just, it was very clear to this fan base and something that I said a a fair amount when people, you know, I think because you've seen a lot of people take shots at U of H's attendance this year is that this isn't, these aren't fans staying home because of 2023 results. These are fans who were fed up about this coach already who aren't seeing a reason to spend their hard-earned discretionary income and their time to go watch a football project that's not getting better in a coach who is just adamant that everything is not his fault. They're just, there was no coming back from this. There was no way that Daniel Holgerson, like I said at the top, was ever going to get this fan base back on his side. Yeah, and, and of all years to have fan apathy, this was not the year. This was the year you should have been able to sell out the the tickets with no problem. And we did, technically, right? I mean, yep. but... But there were 34,000 we, tickets sold for that Oklahoma State game, Dustin. Were there 34,000 butts and seats in your opinion? <laughs> right? And so and so you had the excitement from the fan base. You had everyone buying in. Everyone was super excited going into this year. And honestly, I think we all gave Dana a pass kind of going, "Hey, look decent this year. Just just look decent and you're back next year." Like, we know we're moving into a harder conference. 
we know that a bowl is going to be the thing is like the goal. And sometimes you fall short of the goal and you don't always get fired when you fall short of the goal. Right. We knew it was going to be tough. Yeah. We knew it was going to be tough going into the year. And, and I don't think anyone's expectations were super high. No one, no one realistically thought we would go in and, and lose two conference games. Right. It just, when he lost the rice, it was kind of like, man, this may be it. Right. Like you're going to have to really sh- show us something. And if you, if you don't like, you may have to go. And so for me this year, all he had to do was look decent and he didn't even look decent. He, you know, going into the year, he was probably right. He did have a fucking impossible buyout. A lot of people would have gone, that's a lot of money for U of H to spend. That's not something we do a lot of. We didn't know that he would suck this bad, right? We didn't know this year would be this fucking bad. And so it was it kind of an impossible buyout. I thought it was. I, I said on the pod and I said on our, our pod last week, our, our uh, premium pod last week about this, that I thought we were going to give him the, uh, the Scott Frost treatment. I thought he was going to have to bring in new coordinators. That buyout's huge. But I heard somebody, I can't remember who it was on Twitter, pointed out, well, you're going to pay him next year. And then you're going to fire him. You're still owing him the same amount of money. It's not like we get it, you, you're paying him the same amount, whether you get rid of him now or whether you get rid of him after next year, the buyout goes down, but it's the $300,000 a month. It's the same thing, no matter how you're doing it. So I, I thought that was super, a, a, a very interesting way to think about it is you're not saving money by paying him, paying it out next year. I guess the money you save is the, you know, one less year of having to pay a different head coach, a head coaching salary. But I think it's a good point that that the buyout wasn't as as daunting as many people lead among them. Dana Holgerson uh, wanted everyone to believe that it was. And, you know, I I think it's interesting. We talked before the year because I think we got a man. I remember heading into this this football season is feels like a long time ago, even though it wasn't that long ago. I remember it just felt like every other day someone either tweeting at us or DMing us or wanting to like, Hey, come on the pod and talk about, you know, what does Dana Holgerson have to do in year one in the big 12? What's a successful year? What's not the Vegas line over under this year was four and a half. So we only, we only missed our win total by a half of a game. Um, But I think every time we got asked that question, our answer was some variety of, you know, it depends. Like there's not one number, right? There's not one number of wins that's going to get you there. It's how does this team look over the course of the season? Right. I think there's a four win season Dan Holgerson could have had that he kept his job and came back next year. Yeah. As a good recruiting class or something. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's like, like y'all said, it's one, it's one in which you have some sort of decent recruiting class. It's one in which probably the Big 12 looked better as a whole conference than it did this year where you didn't have the loss to Rice. You didn't have double digit losses to both of the other teams that were joining the Big 12. You know, a year in which, you know, maybe Baylor has a really good season. You lose that game in Waco, but you you win one of the two against Cincinnati or UCF, so you don't look like the clear third best out of three coming in from from the American. You know, like you don't have quite as many. Maybe the TCU game is a close loss. Maybe the Texas Tech game is a close loss. You know, I, I feel like you can you can tinker with some things on the margin here and and get to the point where you go, okay, yeah, Dana comes back with a with a four and eight record, but not a four and eight record where you looked that. You know, you talk about playing competitive football. We played way too much uncompetitive football this year. Even if, <laughs> Yeah. It's funny because a week ago we were roasting. Such a him, wild right? thing to say, also when you've been so uncompetitive. Sorry, right? No, it's funny because a week ago we were roasting him for being like, "Oh, well, you know, it, you know, it's it's about comp- it's about being competitive." Man, it's like I said, you could have come back at four and five at four and eight if you had been more competitive, but you were a four and eight where, you know, I keep harping on it, but you were two plays away from being two and ten in a underwhelming Big Twelve with the loss to freaking Rice. So, yep. um, yeah, not not. I mean, it just, and again, I think we were all, we were, cause we were all group texting yesterday. We all had different numbers, but I think we were all thought there was a less than 50% chance that they mm-hmm. were going to make this move. We thought that the most likely outcome was Dana coming back next year. So kudos yep. to, <coughs> excuse me, the U of H administration for making the move and knowing that they had to make the move and, and uh, looking forward to, you know, Houston taking this job, this, taking this job to market. And I think a really important factor here, it's not a uh, U of H uh, related thing, but the fact that Baylor today here on Sunday made it official that Dave Aranda will be back for a uh, fourth season or no fifth season away. Go this past season was his fourth season because not saying that Baylor really, because that Baylor doesn't change your ability to what you're going to be able to pay a new coach, what you're going to be able to pay that new coach's assistance, what you're going to have to deal with uh, in terms of Dan's buyout. The most important factors 
are and always will be within the University of Houston and, you know, the athletic supporters and on and on and on. But Baylor not going to market at the same time absolutely does make a difference here. It does mm-hmm. yep. it does mean that you are not competing directly with them for the pool of candidates, which I think we're going to get to here in a little bit. But I think that's a really important external factor as well, because as much as we kind of feel a certain way about Baylor, as much as they were an absolutely terrible, terrible, terrible football team this year, that is still a team that spent the last almost 30 years getting Big 12 money, getting Power 5 resources and everything that comes with it. It's an uncomfortable uh, thought to have, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to win potentially a head-to-head with uh, with the candidates that we're going to talk about here a little bit out there. So I think that's an important thing to uh, also mention as well. Yeah, I agree with everything yeah. you guys said. Yeah, it feels like this is kind of uh, fallen into place for us, right? Getting um, trailer didn't. I, I know I'm talking candidates, but some of the some of the bigger names didn't get jobs that you thought they might get. And now you almost have your pick of the guys in our area that you that are looking to are looking to step up that you might be interested in. We're going to talk about them later, but like you said, Sam Baylor not not firing Aranda is going to save us a decent amount of change. Yeah, I was very surprised about that. Did did not think that they were going to uh, let us be the only other Texas school of a roughly similar profile to go to market. Yeah, and I think it's exciting that Baylor's not the job's not opening up, and it's exciting. Just regardless, I think to to take this job to market as a Big Twelve team, you know, we haven't. Yep, we haven't got the University of Houston has not gotten to you know hire a coach to a power conference what since we went from Jenkins uh, Jenkins to uh, to Helton as as a as a member of the Southwest Conference back in the nineties. So this is uh, this is the first time since then that we've gotten to really see hey who is going to be interested in the University of Houston as a job in a power conference. And that's mm-hmm. you know, part of the excitement of, of joining uh, this conference was, was figuring out what our ceiling is in all of our various sports uh, football included. And I think part of figuring out what that ceiling is, is, is finding out how attractive this job is. You know, mm-hmm. we, we've over the years for, for years and years, honestly, literally seen the speculation of, of people, even ones, even people not affiliated with U of H long saying that, you know, when this job opens up in a power conference, there's going to be a huge long line of candidates. Well, let, let, let's see. Let's, I, I, you know, as yeah. much as we've got, we've got a number of guys that we're going to talk about here, but you know, is it going to be any, I mean, honestly, I'd be fine with kind of any of them, but you know, is, is it them? Is it someone else? Do you have a, you know, I don't, I don't want to, again, you don't want to force any to compare everyone to Kelvin Sampson, but I remember when we hired Kelvin Sampson we had a list of candidates we were kind of thinking about, and then they pulled one where you go, Oh, I wasn't even thinking about him. Of course. You know, is, is there one of those in the wings waiting where you go, Oh, oh my gosh, I hadn't even thought that this person was considering it. So Hard to know yet what it's going to be, but, uh, you know, and, and it's a little bit scary as well because, you know, since he was the first of, of the new teams in the Big 12 from the Americans to, to go to market with their Big 12 job, and they're also in a pretty fertile recruiting ground. You know, I wouldn't say it's it's completely equal to Houston, but, you know, Ohio is also, there's a ton of talent there as well. And, you know, they're not exactly thrilled with their choice after a year. So if you make the wrong choice, you're, you're giving this guy probably three or four years to. Yeah, you still got to choose him. Yeah, we it, could. Every, every, everyone can apply for the job. Every coach yeah. ever can apply for the job. You still got to choose the right one for Houston. Exactly. So, you know, and, you know, you make the wrong choice. All of a sudden, you, you're, you know, the next three or four years, you're, you're watching some guy who's not the right answer. So, and, you know, spoiler alert, even if it's a great choice, uh, we're probably going to find things about the new guy that we don't love. So it's, it's that whole moment of, you know, not knowing who your, uh, who your coach is yet and, and just getting this to, it's, it's the excitement. It, it is that it could be anything. It could be a boat. It could be, you know, uh, a complete dud that's uh, that's not doing any better than uh, than the last guy. So it's scary and exciting moment uh, for sure, especially with it being, like I said, uh, the first time with this job coming open uh, in the Big 12. Yeah, and I would only say to, uh, I guess, kind of my final thought on the, I mean, certainly not my, my last ever thought on Dana Holger. So I'd love, <laughs> love for that to be the case. I'd love to be able to do the uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind thing <laughs> and uh, just mind wipe the majority uh, bad memories of the last five seasons of Cougar football. But I would just say, get behind the next guy. Even if it's not yep. your preferred candidate, if you want this team to be a winning big 12 team, but you were staying away because you didn't understand for understandable reasons, like, cause you didn't like Dana, didn't think Dana was the guy fine, whatever it's in the past. I'll support this next guy. Like your, your butt in the seat, your donation, your season ticket is going to help this be, the best big 12 player could be. You don't have to be a club level sweet kind of donor to make a positive difference for this team. Don't just like, if it's halfway through the first season, this coach is dealing with first season things be like, well, I I got better things to do. 
Call me when this is a 10 win team. And I realize I'm probably not speaking to people listening to a Houston podcast. So I'm not going to belabor the point. Well, people do, people do that a lot. They just no, for sure. It. For sure. They love like going after the people who are the most engaged fans. Why aren't there more butts in seats? I don't know, buddy. If I could get U of H uh, guaranteed 35, 36,000 asses in seats each week and I'd be getting a highly pay, I, I assume getting a high salary from the University of Houston because mm-hmm. I've somehow worked something that they have, haven't been able to do as consistently over the history. So, but that, that's just my, my thing. Don't, if this coach doesn't have the greatest first season, this could be this coach could be the coach that gets this team over the hump. But if you just check out on them after us winning four or five games next season, it's going to make it harder for that to happen. So I've asked this fan base that has been clamoring to get rid of this coach for, I think, nearly all valid reasons to get behind the next guy because that's what's going to help us get the next step here. Yeah. All right, I'm done cheerleading. I'm off my soapbox. Dustin, you want to lead us through the thorny woods of candidates unless you have something else, Bobby, you want to all, all I was going to say is to just kind of reiterate your point and just kind of ask you guys new guy, whoever he is, is he going into a true year zero situation here? Do you yeah. feel, do you feel like four yeah. years is it, you, you got to give them the four years. I would say four years, unless the recruiting and off field indicators are really bad. Yes. There's, there's always going to be a situation where it's I, like, I'm not saying I disagree. Yeah. I was just asking the yeah. question. Cause I that, think that's so. mine. That's mine. Dustin. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a, again, I think it comes out of the same thing. It, it depends on how it looks, right? I'm not going to say four years and then, you know, he, a guy could have the worst three years imaginable and we could be okay. Well, you know, it's clear things aren't going right here. So um I, I like I said, I, I think the best way to look at it is as though next year is year zero and we're not even going to really start evaluating the job that he's doing probably until, uh, until 2025 is probably the way that I would uh, conceptualize it. We could just go from there. Yep. How about you, Bobby? Yeah, I think, I think, like Dustin said, there are exceptions to the rule, but I definitely think the damage has kind of been done with this program. And if you if you give a guy three years, a lot of times that last recruiting class that he kind of saves is his first one and and he, he can make it, you know, a decent amount. But this guy's coming into eight recruits and he's just gonna have to be looking for portal guys the whole time. There's he he's he may be coming into a decent situation for next year, right? Where, like I said earlier, he's got that returning offensive talent, but the foundation just isn't laid right now after with this recruiting class, how the portal looks for this team right now. You're going to lose a lot of guys to the portal with, uh, with Holgerson leaving. So it's, uh, I don't, I don't know if the foundation to build a strong house is here in year one. So it's tough for me to say that, oh yeah, you get three years and figure it out. I don't like that. I think we all agree the the power people should skew to patience here because yeah. yes. again if there's if there's grains of truth and I think that Dana not being the coach here is good I, I think that's breaking news here I think we all agree on that I think he did say some hard truths to us about the level of resourcing and stuff like that were they hard truths backed up with any obvious coaching acumen in the years of the last couple no but they were some hard truths I think we needed to hear that. You know, at the start of his tenure, the roster wasn't old enough that we some, aren't. Some, that, some Tom Penders ask hard truths, right? Yeah. Although, although honestly, Tom Pender squeezed a lot more juice out of it. And again, very funny as me as a uh, as a avowed Tom Penders hater, but certainly with hindsight, like obviously, like what Tom was getting resource at U of H. Like, okay, yeah, I sort of get why he wasn't able to get any local kids here, and he did like at least raise the floor a bit, which I think is probably the job of the next guy. Honestly, is to. Yeah. Raise the raise the floor, but have this be a more respectable looking product. You got to win a conference title like Pinders did. No, That's I don't the, know about that one. I don't know about Pinders has a conference one, title, baby. I was there and an NCAA, and an NCAA <laughs> tournament, bid, yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, we'll go ahead and jump into some of the possible replacement candidates that have been floated out there. Uh, I literally have, I, I tried to be a completionist, and I found ten names that I've seen linked at least semi credibly to the U of H job uh in the uh you know hours you know kind of preceding and uh following uh Dana's firing. So I've grouped them into three categories. We're just gonna run down them one through ten. So we'll just talk about each category individually and uh who are kind of the names that we like that fall within those categories. And the first one that I have it first because A, I have the most names. I have four of my ten in here and also because I think probably two of the names that are getting most of the uh the run are in this category. That is head coaches of Local-ish G5 programs. The four names that I've seen that fall into this category are Willie Fritz uh, from Tulane, Jeff Trailer, UTSA, uh, GJ Kinney, Texas State, and John Sumrall, uh, Troy. 
Sam, who, uh, who within this list, who do you like? Who's your, who's your pick? If we're, if we're going for a G5 head coach, who do you like? I would say Jeff Trailer. Uh, I, I think out of that group, he's my pick. Like GJ Kenny intrigues me so much though, because mm-hmm. you, you saw Dustin when you lived with me in San Marcos, the apathy around that Texas State program to immediately get out of the box there with a mostly new roster and win the seven games. I would understand why if you're U of H, you don't want to pull the trigger on a guy who has a total of like two seasons as a head coach, one at the FCS level in Incarnate Word and one just done now at Texas State. But I think that's like that's a guy, a really interesting guy long term, but I don't I don't know if he's I don't know if he has the resume yet to uh to be the guy here at U of H with, with trailer, I feel like he checks all the boxes. A really successful high school coach, uh previously at Gilmer, won I believe four state titles, the four A level there, has worked as an assistant uh in this footprint at the Cal College in Austin, also in Arkansas and SMU as well, and took a program that I don't want to age any of us here, but our friendship is several years older than the UTSA football program. Not the UTSA football program's Division I history. The UTSA football program period is several years younger than uh, than the three of us uh, having the wonderful friendship we've shared these last 16-ish years. That, you know, I, I just... That he's able to win there consistently. I realize, like, a decent amount of that is guys who... Uh, he inherited Frank Harris, I think chief among them, but also previously Sincere McCormick. The receivers he's had there, Zakari Franklin and Josh Cephas as well. He's inherited... He inherited good pieces, but he got so much more of that program than anyone prior. A program with v- very little Division One history was able to really excite that fan base. And, and I know, again, I do find it a red flag that he lost uh, two games to the University of Houston these last two years. I would not dispute <laughs> anyone who's like, hey, man, I'm not sure about this guy based on that. I would I would just say, one, as fun as it was, the game, the game in San Antonio... Uh, last season was I think you eventually had like an eight percent win expectancy in the at, at the end of that, which I mean it doesn't take one iota away from the win, but a lot of crazy stuff happened in that one. Frank Harris was obviously not healthy at the beginning of this season, which again doesn't take away from that being one of U of H's four wins this year, but they were obviously a very different team in November than they were in September. And that he was able to take that team out of a one and three slide to as of this past weekend still being in the AAC championship picture in their first year in the league, I think it's pretty damn impressive. He immediately gives you credibility in high school recruiting. That's my short pitch for Jeff Trailer, who's my favorite out of that group. Yeah, I think my only qualms with Jeff Trailer is is just kind of like a is what he's doing sustainable after their very like senior heavy class like graduates mm-hmm. this year. Fair, yeah. Everybody is is that still a sustainable program, or did he kind of get one class together and ride it to, uh, to this job? And like I said, I. I I don't know that it's disqualifying to me that he lost to Dana Holgerson um, to each of the last two years. It's bad optics at the very yeah. least. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, doesn't look, it doesn't look great to hire a guy that lost. Hey, to guys. Hey, guys. Do we so, have the coach for you? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. So, we'll, so we'll see. Again, I, again, he's someone I could very easily get on board with for all the reasons you said, Sam. I think there are some uh, some maybe slightly red flags there, though. Bobby, yeah. thoughts, on, thoughts on Jeff Trailer and who your, uh, who your pick for a G5 head coach would be if we go that route? Yeah, I have the same concerns with uh, Jeff Trailer that pretty much everyone else has already said. I worry how the team, you know, lost their quarterback and they started to not look very good. And then when he came back, they started to look pretty good again, right? And so for me, that just feels like Jimbo Fisher writing a national title off the back of Jameis Winston to the A&M job. Tom and, Herman and, getting the UT job with Greg Ward. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and so it just has that kind of vibe to me. Like, is he a good coach or is he – or or did, like you said, Dustin, he recruit really well one year? But here's the thing. I'm okay if you recruit really well one year. Like, that's fine. If, if you do this, cool. Um, you give me You give me the UTSA of the Big 12. I'm taking it, right? Two really good years. Took you a little bit of time when your quarterback goes down and stuff like that. It's still fun football to watch, right? But um trailer that that's my concern and why I have uh I have Willie Fritz ahead of him. And really, to be honest with you guys, I'm one hundred percent on board with Willie Fritz. I there isn't and I'll just spoil the rest of it. There isn't another candidate you're gonna name that I like more than Willie Fritz. He wins everywhere he goes. Where hasn't he won? He wins everywhere, right? No matter the level, he wins. And I like it. So I'm going to bring him here on that. That's that's like the number one reason. But two, you got a guy who's a local guy who like has recruited the area before. Uh, you know, Tulane's coming in. 
Tulane, you know, he's coming from Tulane. Tulane recruits a lot of our area, can recruit Mississippi. He's shown he's a good recruiter. He's shown he can win at a situation that may not be the best, right? No, when he took over Tulane, no one was like, what a great job to take. Like, it was a, it, it was a job in the American. It was a pretty good job, right? Uh, better than most G5s. And he just is, he just taken them, flipped them and made them pretty good over the last couple of years. Yeah, I, I think Willie Fritz is probably my number one pick too, honestly, for kind of the same reason. Of, of all the coaches who are, I think, still on the upward trajectory of the get coaches that we're going to name on this list, he's the one who is who is currently winning at the highest level. Houston, eight? Houston got an eight. See, that is... Wow. The, wow. Iowa State got a seven even. That is, that's very upsetting. So Houston will be facing wow. uh, UC Santa Barbara in the first round if they win, would face Stanford again in the NCAA tournament for the second year in a row, so... Uh, that's, wow. that's, that's that's the point. Stan, the Stanford is a rough second round matchup. That that is a yeah. good. That is a, we got to see that per, close and personal. That was a really really good team last year. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's tough. That's upsetting. It, yeah. Disappointing. Disappointing for the team. Hope to see them do well in the first round, and obviously would love to see them give yeah. Stanford a game. But man, we're definitely hoping to not have to face a team that that quality until uh until the second. Sweet, Ho- so. Hoping Fresno State has a little bit of uh, last year's Auburn in them too. Because I mean, <laughs> you've and you've pointed out, Dustin, like not to say last year's team didn't deserve to be in the sweet 16. It wasn't one of the best 25 inch volleyball teams in the country last year, but did, did get a nice little boost of Auburn eliminating last year's host Creighton last yep. year. Yeah. Yep. Um, all right. Willie wow. Fritz, Willie Fritz, Willie, Willie Fritz, Fritz, Willie Fritz. Fritz. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, he just, he's, he's winning at the closest thing to the P five level you can get without actually being at the P five. And he's, and he's, like I said, like Bobby said, he's won at every level up until this point. The only knock I think you can really have on him is that he's, He's 63, but he's, yep. he still seems to be at the height of his abilities and, and trending upwards. And I think he has uh, several years left if, if that's what he wants to do for a while. So, you know, Jeff Trail, I think it's absolutely right to compliment him on, on taking over uh, essentially, like Sam said, a brand new program and winning there. Willie Fritz didn't do that, but man, he took over a program that it's not uh, a brand new, but it's a program that has a long, long, long history of losing, <laughs> which I don't, I don't know if that's better or harder or easier, but it's probably pretty similar to, uh, yep. to, uh, to what certainly similar. Yeah. No, I would say, and just quick for the people at home who aren't familiar, like, okay, you know vaguely he's the guy at Tulane. I remember facing him several years there, but before he was at Tulane, he uh, was at Georgia Southern for two years where he led their transition from uh, FCS to level below this one to FBS. Uh, went 8-0 and against the Sun Belt his first year, though, when I believe 17 or 18 games in the two years he was there. Before that, he was at Sam Houston, uh, took them to the FCS playoffs three of the four years there, two of those years. He took the Bearcats with a K to a national championship game, lost to the just juggernaut that is North Dakota State, but was to that point the best coach in Sam Houston history. I think it's probably been surpassed by his successor, Casey Keeler, who won at Natty in the spring of 2021 season. But like also he left Casey Keeler a much better program than uh, he got when he took over. So I would say Willie Fritz is a good case there. Before that was uh, won almost a hundred games uh, at Central Missouri, just built them into a consistent winner, I believe is their program's uh, winningest ever head coach. Coach Juco Ball at Blinn previously as well. A guy who's coached at almost literally every level but this one has won at a level at Tulane that is completely unprecedented, certainly in the modern era, maybe ever for Green Wave football, but certainly in the last 50 years. I think the first ever to take them to back-to-back double-digit win seasons. I think they're uh, 20, 22 in like four or something like that the last two years, which it's Tulane, guys. Like We remember Tulane just being like a, a team that was just like, oh, cool. It's a, it's a fun road trip every other year and an easy win at home, like during the CUSA and early American days. And to turn from that to not just a pesky, like six, seven win team, which I think is what he did before the stage, but to turn him from that to a, a consistent contender in the best group of five league, I, I think nothing short of amazing. I think the only knock, and it's not even really a knock on him personally, it's the timing, guys. I know Bobby's going to be like, Fuck the timing, just bring him in whatever. But the timing really matters here because Georgia Tech almost hired this guy last year and he rightfully told them, hey, I'm not going to jump before the American Championship game. I'm not going to jump before the New Year's Six Bowl yet and had a chance to do what he did there and beat USC in the Cotton Bowl, which I, I would say, if it's not the greatest ever two-lane win, it is one of the best two or three ever because I just don't know their like, pre-1960s history. But like, and he's not, and like, I love the University of Houston, but if U of H is like, no, 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 we need a decision now. We're not such a good job that he's going to be like, all right, I'm bailing. If, you know, and I think, I think Tulane's a pretty good sized favorite against SMU in the American championship game because SMU is without their starting quarterback. So if they win the American and he's like, I got to coach this team until January, 
I'm sorry, guys. Like the timing just doesn't work out here. Like just you cannot in this current era not have a coach on board coaching for you until January. And I don't blame Lloyd Fritz at all for doing that because he's compensated nicely. He is going to probably get himself a statue built at Tulane. He has the leverage here. But I think he would be, for all the reasons you guys said, just an unbelievable home run hire. Yeah. Uh, a couple of other guys, like I said, we mentioned G.J. Kinney, Texas State, done a really remarkable job there. Um, but, man, just you talk about the opposite of Willie Fritz being the guy that's gotten the closest, just hasn't really, you know, other than one year as an analyst at Arkansas back in 2018, just no experience at the P5 level. Um, like I said, you could kind of say the same about Fritz, but at least Fritz is winning in the next biggest, you know, next best thing in the AAC, has a longer track record. So uh, I kind of see Kenny as like a higher risk, higher reward, younger version of Fritz maybe. And then John Summerall, probably someone who I would be a little surprised if that's the pick. Um, I saw a lot of people kind of saying he'd be the uh, slam dunk for for Kentucky when they thought that uh, A&M was going to hire uh, Mark Stoops away from them. But has been a defensive assistant in the SEC for several years, which you kind of associate that with uh, being synonymous with me. You're probably a good recruiting guy if, if a bunch of SEC teams are hiring you. And then uh, took over as the head coach at Troy two years ago and has gone 22-4 and four as a head coach uh, at Troy. So not bad at all. Again, a lot of time in SEC country, maybe he holds out for an SEC job, has no real ties to Texas that I can see, but certainly someone who's been real successful and is local enough that, you know, wouldn't uh, wouldn't be mad about that hire um, if that's yeah. the way they go. Uh, I just want to say I refuse to support G.J. Kinney because I watched him torch my Houston Cougars too much. And if you were if you played when I was in college, you're too young. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm not saying I'm young, but I, it'll make me feel terrible just about where I am. So if we could just avoid that, like five more years, like the next coach can be for when I was in in college. But like, I can't have watched you beat my team and to be like, and like yelled at you while you were doing it and then be like, yeah, I like you coaching my team. I don't like that, man. I don't like it. So- I, can, I can look past it. Let him, let him, <laughs> if, he, if he's the best guy and U of H's decision makers are like, this is the guy. I, my old ass will watch him and be fine like, with it. I want you to I get it. I get I'm it. Bobby. I do like, lose my mind. No, I- that's why I'm saying no to GJ Kinney. Right away. I need an old guy co- t- coaching my team. Here, and I know old... soon I will be the I old bad guy. News for you, Bobby. I need an old guy to coach the team, please. Here, here's how recently G.J. Kinney was playing college football. When The year after G.J. Kinney graduated, uh, the when American Athletic Conference preseason poll came out, and I was doing some blog at the time, and I did a little blog blurb on the, the preseason poll coming out, and Houston was ahead of Tulsa. I'm pretty sure they had beaten us this last year on campus. Um, and so, or maybe I'm, I'm thinking, but wasn't anyway, was his last year, the 2011 season finale? Maybe. I think I so. Keep talking, keep talking. talking. I will, I will look this up. Not important point, point being, yeah, not important um, that I just did a little blurb on the article and, uh, GJ Kinney's grandfather comments and is just like, oh, I can't believe they have Houston. I, I can't believe you have Houston. Ah. So, and I was just, I just responded and was like, well, it's, I didn't have Houston out of Tulsa. Like I'm just, I'm commenting on someone else doing it. <laughs> and, and also if, <laughs> If anyone has Houston ahead of Tulsa, surely it's only because uh, Tulsa's quarterback won't be as good next year. And he, I was like giving him bait. Trying and to then like, Cody oh, Green oh, just oh, absolutely oh, just fucking he, destroyed he, us. He ignored me and never responded. So. Uh, good times, good times all around. His last year in college was 2011, which, as you point out, Dustin, uh, not at all, not at all relevant to the story. But uh, <laughs> yeah. we're just the kind of psychos that have to look that up. Good times. <laughs> All right, so category number two that I've got here is bounce back head coaches. This is also guys uh, that have been head coaches, but aren't, well, I guess one of them is currently a head coach also, but, uh, but is, you know, not necessarily on the current upward trajectory. Maybe we're looking to bounce back. So the three guys that I've got in this category, and you can tell me if you like any of these names at all, because I feel, I feel like all three of these guys, Maybe you like one of them, but probably at least one you're going to be like, God, no, that's the one name on this list that I like refuse to support. So here are the three names that I have in this category. Cliff Kingsbury, Gary Patterson, Barry Odom, Bobby. Who do you, who do you like? Who do you not like? Oh, man. Uh, so I have been – Sam and I have talked this – we've workshopped this one. I know who you're about to talk about. Yep. It's Gary Patterson. Um and to be honest, the more I think about Gary Patterson, the less I want him to come here. So he's I, I, he's an older guy who showed no ability to adjust his offense. No, everyone remembers those really, really good TCU teams, like the really, really good ones. But man, those last four or five years at TCU, 
they were not good. They were four win teams. They were five win teams. It, it clearly looked like he had been passed by a little bit. Now I know he's done a lot of um, not. I'm blanking on the word. Not consultation, but he's an analyst. He was, he's done yeah, a lot. He of, was uh, he was like a senior off field guy. I, I think he was yeah, higher than an analyst, but not an on field coach for yeah for Sarkeesian last year at Texas. Yeah, yeah. And so maybe he's been around some offense that will change his mind and innovate a little bit. But just you're going to have to pay him a decent amount, I think. Um, and that's just I, you don't have to pay a buyout to Fritz or Trailer or somebody like that. But just he just doesn't he. He doesn't excite me like he does some other people. He's a really good name, and it's going to be one of the – that's a name that will dominate uh, sports radio down in Houston. It will get on 610. It will get on 790, and people will be talking about it. But I don't think it's necessarily the best case for U of H. I would say he is not my first choice. I think Gary Patterson is a somewhat better candidate than you were giving him credit for. Yes, didn't go as well the last four or five years there. I think I think just it's it's a higher it's going to be a more affordable hire because you're not having to pay whatever Tulane and UTSA's buyouts are. It's a guy with a ton of Big Twelve experience, coaching the Big Twelve over a decade in addition to the decade prior when TCU was a very very successful Group of Five program or non BCS whatever you would call it from that era. I I think the important question is for me because he was it was a guy when he left or was pushed out or whatever you want to say about his end to, to the time at TCU. It's a guy who didn't sound very thrilled about the current level of player agency, NIL, and all that yeah, stuff. And yeah. like it or lo- like it or lump it, you have to be pro this to succeed at U of H. You have to be all in on NIL. You have to be somebody who's not working as an impediment there, which I don't think Dana was, to be clear. But you can't be an impediment there. I think my other question would be, what's he going to do offensively? And, and this one, TCU wasn't Iowa. TCU had good offensive teams under Patterson, but wasn't consistent. I would say if you wanted to point to that program's downfall and just backslide, it wasn't consistent enough, but they still, I will point out, even as the results got less consistently good, they were still recruiting at a high level. That was still a super talented roster that Sonny Dykes got there. So this is a guy who certainly, I think will raise the recruiting ceiling here. It's somebody who might actually give us a half decent defense to look at at some point. I was doing the points per game of the last 10 years. And just like, we really got spoiled guys from about 2013 to I I think right before the 2018 season of like good defenses, because it's just it's mostly fallen off a fucking cliff here with the 2021 season being a nice little exception against a not so great strength of schedule in the middle. there, I I think he would he would do that. But again, we'll say what I say at the top. Gary Patterson's not my first choice here, but I think I'd like it a bit more than Bobby if that ends up being the guy here. I I think there are definitely some pros, uh, I think, in his favor. I think the best argument in favor of Gary Patterson is that he went and spent a year with the Longhorns program this past year. You know, if Gary... Patterson had went and spent the past year being like a TV, a TV studio analyst. I think I would be really, really hesitant. Whereas like, I think it would be relatively easy to, for him to like, I feel like by the end of the press conference, I could be fully on board with the hire. If kind of like you said, Sam, he's saying the right things about, you know, okay, Hey, I've, I've, I've gone to a, a place where they are, they're definitely doing NIL stuff. And I've seen that that's <laughs> the thing I need to do. I've went to a place where, Hey, they're throwing the ball around the park and they have an exciting offense. And, you know, and I, I, and I've, and I've realized I need to find a, a young, excited mind. Cause I, I very well believe that if he's inclined to do so, that Gary Patterson could find an innovative, exciting offensive mind to come in and essentially hand over the, the offense to and, and, and worry probably more about the defense as more his, his, uh, you know, emphasize specialty side of the ball there. So, you know, I agree, like, kind of like Bobby said, I, th- I think the end of his tenure at TCU, it looked like modern football was evolving away from him somewhat. But like I said, I, I believe that, I, I believe that he's got something, some rabbits still in his hat, some, some tricks to up his, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. I just, it, it's, it's, I could be talked into it, but I would have to be talked into it is probably, yeah, uh, the best way to put it. Um, Cliff Kingsbury, I'm, I'm intrigued. I don't say my son, I saw you kind of talking this crap, talking this one on Twitter and I don't even have like a coherent argument for why I love I- the offense. To be clear, I love okay. the offense. I, that 2011 offense was just the, my platonic ideal of a Cougar offense, but yeah, I think you'll get into why there are issues with this. Right. So he's someone who <laughs> interestingly started his career at U of H as a, as an assistant was, uh, Famously, the head coach of Texas Tech from 2013 to 2018 parlayed that into a head coaching job with the Arizona Cardinals, despite not having won all that many games at Texas Tech. Uh, ended up not winning all that many games with the Arizona Cardinals either and got fired uh, this past season was uh, the uh, quarterback's coach at USC, I believe. 
uh, this past season. So, you know, he's someone who's got name recognition. He's someone who I think could recruit well to the University of Houston. Uh, he's someone who just in terms of being relevant and being a name that people want to talk about and making Houston more newsworthy, interesting, if that is something that matters at all, he'll have that in his quarter. But, you know, coming off of two head coaching jobs where he was under 500 uh, at both head coaching jobs is not super exciting. I, 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 I've been trying to like put my finger on why I'm kind I would kind of be okay with it. And I think it is just that like, you know, literally two seasons ago, the dude was the head coach of a playoff NFL team. And it just went, you know, that's, that's, that's not nothing, I guess. And it just, I think you, you've seen a non zero number of times that a guy is a flawed college coach, ends up going to the NBA either as an assistant or a head coach. And then kind of just, it, it's such a master class that when he comes back, that he looks, he looks better as a head coach than he did before. And that's even, again, not to keep bringing this guy up and, and making everyone like damned with a comparison, but like even with Kelvin Sampson, I think was, was clearly someone who went to the, went to the pros and then came back and, and was better for it. So I think that there's something there. I think the offense could be fun. Again, I, I think it's kind of the inverse of Patterson where he'd have to come in and be like, all right, like I'm going to be the face of the program. I'm going to be the offense and I'm going to, you know, I have the name and NFL recognition that I can, I can attract a defensive coordinator that I can just wholly turn that side of the ball over to and, uh, and stand back, I guess. Yeah, I wouldn't look, I don't think Cliff's going to happen. And I, I would be excited though. Like you guys said, if, if Cliff came on board, it would be intriguing, whether it's the offense, the defense, let's just see what's going to happen. Like that's, we can admit that's fun. That's exciting to just be like, I don't know. It's, it's a risk. And if it hits, it's gonna be awesome. If it doesn't, we're no worse off than we are now, right? Like <laughs> it's just it feels like a uh it feels like if it hits, it's gonna be so much fun. And if it doesn't, we're just gonna be like, we probably should have saw that one coming, right? Like it's kinda like, well, we did it to ourselves at the end of the day. That was fun, but I'm out. <laughs> I'll say if this is gonna be a four to seven win kind of team. That'll be a f- more fun brand of four to seven win football than I think what <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah. we're in currently. So I, I'll, I'll give him that. And I think my concern and people can change their minds. And I'm not going to hold this against Cliff, but Cliff has been very vocal of just like, I don't know if I want to be a college head coach again, just mm-hmm. given the, it's a lot of, you know, you're, you're supervising a hundred ish 18 to 23 year olds. And there's a lot of just annoying non football coach stuff that goes with that. And I think his general, his general point there was just like, I enjoy the ball coaching aspects of this. And frankly, coaching ball is like way down the list of responsibilities if you're going to be a CEO of the program. But I think yeah. that'll be a, a fun offense. I will say, I don't think he's getting the job. Barry Odom is an intriguing guy. I can say as somebody currently sitting about four and a half miles from the Raiders stadium right now, that that guy is probably responsible for UNLV's best season as, as a division one, a slash FBS team in program history. Like I think I think this team set the wins mark against an FCS team from like the early eighties who had to forfeit all their games, uh, for, uh, less stringent academic requirements than the NCAA, uh, <laughs> requires their football teams. Uh, Suge Knight was on that team. Little, little fun. Suge Knight and Randall Cunningham. But I, I think a guy who I think Missouri eventually did get sick of him there, but like, and yeah, Missouri's having a good year this year, but it's a place that's shown like it's a tough place to win the SEC. I won't hold that necessarily against him. He's recruited Texas both from his time at Missouri, uh, also Arkansas's defensive coordinator immediately prior to taking over at UNLV. And I think they have a few Texas commits as well. So I, a guy who I think is qualified would be interesting, but I don't think we'll be getting the job. I think if it's going to be, I think it's going to be any of the guys from this group, it's going to be Patterson or Cliff, even though I don't think either, even though I don't think Cliff is a uh, hugely likely candidate. I'm surprised you talked that long about Barry Odom, Sam, without mentioning that I think the biggest appeal of Barry Odom as the potential hire here would be if he could bring Brennan Marion with him. I knew one of y'all would mention Brennan Marion. Coordinator because that go-go offense that they've got is just a yeah, lot of fun. So much it fun. Really is. Yeah, it really is. It's turned really a, team, a redshirt freshman who came in, I think, third in the depth chart during fall camp into uh, the most likely Mountain West freshman of the year. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. no, no. no. That's... That, that, that was pretty much, you know, the, the, just like the offense has been fun. Brennan Marion, if he could come with, would be a lot of fun. And kind of just echo what you said, you know, the job at Missouri is is kind of like, okay, you know, it is a little bit like Dana Esk where it's like, hey, maybe the fan base should have been a little bit more appreciative of what he was, the level that he was winning at in the conference he was at. But also, like, I also see why the fan base was yeah. uh, was was tired of the results. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I think the best argument is maybe that he's kind of reinventing himself over there at UNLV and, and doing some good things. Because like I said, some coaches have second acts, and a lot of times the way you do that 
is by finding exciting young assistants with new ideas. And it sure seems like he's done that in, uh, in Brendan Marion as the offensive coordinator there. Yeah. And our, our previous coach loved to do that too. You could really see him, uh, him doing that. So <laughs> is that why he's good? Is that, is that the sarcasm I've always been uh, hearing? <laughs> yes. Kids that do? You've always been fond of no on, on Barry Odom. I, I agree with everything you guys have said, especially the, uh, the fan base kind of should have just been like, well, that's not, it's not bad. It's not great. I mean, just, they just won ten bad. games under under his successor, so you know maybe yeah. maybe it was time. Also, was a good defensive coordinator uh, at previous stops as well. Yeah, so you know, it's probably unlikely. I don't think any of us are thinking that it's going to uh, to happen. But like you said, he has recruited Texas before. If you're in the SEC, you're recruiting Texas, Texas or Florida. And if you're in Arkansas and Missouri, you're probably recruiting Texas. All right, and then the final category of coaches we talked about, G5 head coaches, we talked about bounce back head coaches. So our final category is uh, assistants, who po- po- current assistants who could be in line for their first head coaching gig at U of H. I've got three names that I've seen thrown out uh, in regards to this opening. I'll give their brief, uh, quick little resumes too, just since uh, less, less so uh, household names than the guys we've mentioned up until this point probably. Uh, and you guys can let me know if you've seen anyone else that you like or have seen uh, – thrown out for this job. Jeff Banks, uh, a name that I've seen a couple of guys in, in the national media throw out, has been a, a special teams coordinator slash tight ends coach, most recently for the Longhorns, previously uh, the same job at Alabama and before that Texas A&M. Um, so, you know, a lot of high-level programs, if nothing else, sure seem to like him as a recruiter. Sure, sure seems like, you know, some of the, the highest recruiting programs in the country are giving him, you know, important recruiting jobs. Um, and then Will, uh, Will Stein, a young up and young up-and-comer at a absolutely obs- uh, obscene 34 years old, um, but his star seems to be rising. Was at UTSA for three years, uh, two as the passing, go- passing game coordinator, one as co-offensive coordinator, then moved this last year to Oregon. They are scoring a ton of points and winning a ton of games with him running the offense this year. And then Garrett Riley, the o- uh, offensive coordinator at Clemson this year, uh, held the same job at TCU the uh, last year, SMU a couple of years prior to that. Uh, Sam, is there an assistant that uh, you like, or one that I've uh, not mentioned that you think is worth mentioning here? No, I, th- I think I think you have the the three I've mentioned. I like Will Stein from uh, Oregon a lot. Again, very young guy, like you said, like you said, Dustin to have because I think G.J. Kinney is a few months younger than you, but Will Stein is for sure younger than uh, yours truly, which might make me temporarily feel a certain kind of way. But was a started as a Texas high school football coach, uh, was on trailers first staff at UTSA so was a part of the build there didn't just parachute in for one season to have a good offense was a part of their build on that roster a, a part of a Texas program I think I think his job at Oregon is the first time that he's coached outside the state of Texas so somebody I don't think you have Jeff Trailer's level of ties but somebody who would immediately give you credibility uh with the state's high school coaches would give you a more fun offense than what Dana's delivered the last several years. Cause that's what this fan base wants more than anything is just fun offense. We've all, whatever era you've come in on Cougar football, you know, the yeoman veer, the run and shoot years, the, the browse and Sumlin years, you probably came in while U of H was running an exciting, high, high powered, innovative offense. And I think Will Stein would give you that. And I think that's why he's my favorite hire. I don't, I think U of H is fixated on getting somebody who's coming in either as a sitting head coach or, recently former sitting head coach here. So I don't think any of these guys will be the candidates, but I think Will Stein in the chance that it happens, I, I think would be a great hire. I think somebody is going to make Will Stein a head coach sooner than later. And he's going to do quite well there. And certainly I think deliver on the exciting offense aspect as well. Yeah, I, I would probably go with Will Stein as well, but uh, Gary Riley's pretty exciting too. He's led some really, really good offenses. I mean, OC at TCU, um, last year and uh being tc uh clemson's coordinator this year their offenses look pretty good you know not as not the most uh not not like they've had recently but you know smu good offense tcu good offense um and he's just kind of worked at other places that have really good offenses and uh he's got ties to the area i'm big on the recruiting side of this new coach right especially coming in with eight recruits um committed interesting first i'm hearing of this you're gonna you're gonna need to you're gonna need to do you're gonna need to do some work here and uh and 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 recruit and so i think he's shown he can do that in texas as well so while i agree with sam that i i like will stein a little bit more i gotta say garrett riley wouldn't make me terribly disappointed 
Yeah, I think Stein's probably my choice out of these three as well, even though, man, anyone you bring in at 34 just feels like an awfully big, <laughs> an awfully big game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm kind of weirdly intrigued by the Jeff Banks thing, um, just because it sure seems like everyone that talks about him is just like, oh, man, this guy would just, like, recruit like crazy if you if you gave him that job, uh, which is obviously really, uh, really tantalizing. But I don't know. It's a little... It's a little dangerously like Tony Levine esque, right? To be like, mm-hmm. we're gonna bring in a guy who's been a special teams coordinator and like, yep. and essentially, you know, have him be kind of the the CEO of the program. It's like, oh, we tried that not too long ago. Yeah, but you know, I think it, like I think it very much says something that, like I said, A and M, Alabama, UT Austin, yep. all want this guy to be a big part of what they're doing recruiting wise. I think that's yep. that's not nothing. It's a name I could get behind. Will Stein definitely a name I could get behind. Garrett Riley, I don't know. The, like when you guys talk about like you know co- coaches quarterback surfing, yeah. I, I kind of feel like maybe he's been doing that, yeah. you know, Mordecai at SMU and, uh, and Duggan at TCU. I mean, Clemson's like what I checked today, 51 in offensive SP plus. So yeah, not exactly yeah. lighting the world on fire with the Tigers this year, um, offensively. So, and again, like not, a I huge, think that's fair. Yeah. Not a hugely impressive resume. I, I, I don't know. I kind of feel like if he wasn't the younger brother of Lincoln Riley, maybe we wouldn't be talking about him as much. Maybe he wouldn't be on the, uh, the up, upward trajectory that he is. I, know, I, I threw out 10 names. I think he might be my 10 out of 10. But here's the thing, guys. Uh, you know what all 10 of the candidates that I threw out there have in common? They're not Dana Holgerson? They're not Dana Holgerson, and I would prefer any of them to Dana Holgerson. Like, I, yeah. You, we, yeah. Talk, we talked at the top about, like, oh, you know, support the guy, whoever. There is, like, not that much distance between my 1 and 10. Like, my 1 and 10 are probably, respectively, Willie Fritz and Garrett Riley, and there is not that much difference between how I feel about the two of them and how excited I would be for either of them. Uh, to come in as the head coach. So we, t- we talked about Baylor not opening being a good thing, but on the other hand, there's like, I don't know, there's, there's a bunch of guys that they could bring in that I go, yep, makes sense. I can, I can get on board with that. Yeah. I, I don't know that there's anyone on this list that I would go, oh my gosh, I'm just over the moon. Maybe again, maybe there is that like ace in the hole that they had someone all along, uh, you know, that they, they're going to shock everyone by, oh, I didn't realize that guy was in play. Um, but man, it just, it feels like you're throwing at a dartboard with a whole lot of correct answers. I think that's a good way to end it, guys, unless uh, you have anything else. Nope. Nope. Sounds good. Uh, we're going to do our usual. We didn't do our usual intro. We're we doing our usual outro, or are we just going neither because it's a, a special uh, bonus emergency pod? shpodcast at gmail.com, shpawdcast on Twitter, slash SSX. See, my body was rejecting even saying the uh, the other name of uh, Twitter, which just would, <laughs> would let me do it. It's like the Fonz was saying he's wrong. It just, it's not capable. Uh, uh, podcast got b sky dot social did i get that right dustin yes on blue sky uh as well uh anywhere you get podcasts please rate us uh five stars that is free 99 to do and it does genuinely help us i realize you hear probably a lot of podcasts say that but uh no bullshit that helps us uh a whole lot so thanks to those of you that uh listen all the way to the end and dustin what do we always say to close it out go coogs go coogs Vamos los coogs go coogs go coogs Go Cougs. We ain't invited to the party. We had to kick the door in. No cap. 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 No cap.